Anyway, I'm Ian Harley an anaesthetist from Nelson Hospital in Melbourne and I'm going to speak about anaesthesia and the use of echocardiography in aortic valve surgery. Um, we did 414 patients last year and about a quarter of them are aortic valve operations and of the aortic valve replacements, about three quarters of tissue valves and one quarter are mechanical. Um, only about 7% are aortic valve repairs. If you um, get all of those numbers and double them, that probably includes the private hospital across the road. Um, the mortality of simple ABR is relatively low, it's 1.6%, but it rises significantly when it's associated with other procedures. An aortic valve replacement can be associated with any other operating, um, almost any other cardiac operation that there is. So most patients that are undergoing cardiac surgery have had diagnostic echo performed by cardiology and so hopefully, usually, um, there are no surprises when an anaesthetic echo is performed and the preoperative findings are simply, uh, simply confirmed. There are other functions of the intraoperative echo and as well as excluding other pathologies, they are helping in the placement of wires, cannulas and vents, monitoring the hemodynamics and guiding inotrope and fluid administration, confirming the surgical uh, success and excluding complications. The best model for intraoperative echo, I think, is where the images are shared with the surgeon and assessments and decisions made are done collaboratively. And, um, Preparing for this talk has really reinforced to me the importance to anaesthetists of understanding what the surgeon is doing and it's very, because it's very easy to just give an anaesthetic, stop the patient from moving. You do a really good, much better job if you understand what's going on the other side of the blood-brain barrier. So uh, generally speaking, there are a few interoperative surprises when it comes to aortic valve surgery. The diagnosis is usually correct and whether it's a bileaflet or a trileaflet valve, which sometimes you know, turns up, uh, isn't really important as the operation is likely to be the same. But sometimes one finds there's unexpected AR and this will affect the intraoperative um, management of perfusion. And we were told in one of the talks before that there's the surgical procedure which can have a good outcome but it doesn't, it doesn't achieve the same results if you don't have a good left ventricle. And perfusion and protection of the heart while the heart stops is vitally important if at the end of the operation you want to have not only a good surgical result but a good ventricle to go with that result. Um, the gradient is often less when we measure it intraoperatively compared with the preoperative echo. Why is this? Well, patients who are anaesthetised uh, have reduced autonomic tone, reduced inotropic drive and anaesthetic agents cause peripheral uh, vascular vasodilatation. And un an anaesthetised patient is having a lot less stress than someone who's in the cath lab or in the echo lab having a toe probe pushed down their throat while they're awake. Toe also has restricted windows compared with transthoracic echo, so you may not maximise the gradient, and maybe anaesthetists just don't spend as long as cardiologists obtaining the highest gradient. Um, so also the definition of what's severe and what's not severe can differ, but uh, despite all of this, even though the gradient's often different intraoperatively, if you calculate the area, it's amazing how they are usually concordant. Um, this slide shows a patient that we recently did at the Austin and the different assessments of severity arrived at by different modalities. The patient was an obese 68 year old woman awaiting orthopaedic surgery and she was found to have atypical chest pain and a murmur at the cardiac, at the pre-anesthetic clinic. Orthopaedic surgeons don't usually own stethoscopes or take medical histories. Uh, the transthoracic echo measured a gradient of 40 and an area of 0.8 but only called the stenosis moderate to severe maybe taking into account the degree of regurgitation. Uh, the angiogram directly measured an instantaneous gradient of 41, but then used the Gorlin equation, which includes the cardiac output, which has an accuracy of plus or minus 30%, to calculate an area of 0.54 centimetres squared, and it called the stenosis critical. The intraoperative echo only measured a gradient of 30, but calculated an area of 0.9 centimetres squared and called it severe. Um, both the angio on the left and the transthoracic echo on the right measured the gradient at 41 millimetres of mercury and yet one called it stenosis critical and the other called it moderate. It's just interesting how people interpret their measurements. Aortic regurgitation has several consequences. It can disguise poor left ventricular function and may exaggerate the gradient. If the regurgitant valve um, 
in regurgitant valve, the volume passing the valve each systole includes the regurgitant volume, and so the gradient can be higher because of the increased volume passing through the valve. Aortic regurgitation can also interfere with cardioplegia delivery, and it can cause distension of the LV, which has serious consequences. Even mild AR can cause significant problems, particularly if the cross clamp further distorts the aortic valve. When LV distension does occur, it's usually recognised by the surgeon and seen on the echo, and the response is to switch to retrograde cardioplegia until the aorta is opened and use handheld cannulae to stop the heart. This diagram helps explain why AR is such a problem when it comes to cardiac protection. When cardioplegia, which contains high concentrations of potassium and oxygenated blood, is injected into the aortic root, it flows down the coronaries to the myocardium, arresting the myocardial cells in diastole, a state in which their oxygen requirements are much lower. If the aortic valve is leaking, the cardioplegia also flows into the left ventricle, reducing the root pressure and increasing the LV pressure. This reduces subendocardial flow and the cardioplegia solution flows down and cardioplegia solution flow down the coronary arteries. Distension of the LV also causes stretching and damage to the contractile filaments in the myocardial cells. This echo shows regurgitation through the aortic valve, distending the LV during administration of anti-grade cardioplegia in the aortic root before the heart has been stopped but after the cross clamp has been placed on. You can see the LV distending. Um, the jet of cardioplegia may distort the aortic valve and cause distension in the left ventricle. Um, the patient on the, uh, the, the clip on the right shows uh, cardioplegia solution flowing into the aorta and in fact you can see it flowing down the right coronary artery. On the right, uh, the cooling needle is in the aorta but the aortic valve is allowing the cardioplegia and blood solution to flow through the aortic valve and you can see on the other side of the aortic valve there is a flow at the moment and um, that is distending a left ventricle. It's also possible to see how that jet of anti-grade cardioplegia can, um, can disrupt atheroma on the inside the ascending aorta and how the needle could cause a dissection if it wasn't completely all the way through before you started running the cardioplegia. Uh, we often examine the aortic valve in three-dimensional mode. The pictures aren't usually as good as the mitral valve as the valve is in face onto the ultrasound beam. Um, and you don't get good pictures if there's calcification of the aortic leaflets, mitral annular calcification or a mechanical mitral valve in place. 3D isn't very good for measurements either as it only measures them in 2D, but technology is arriving that may make it much better. So the valve on the left is a normal aortic valve and this one's showing up well on 3D echo. The valve on the right is a calcified bicuspid valve and you would hardly know it from looking at it. Uh, on the left is a mechanical aortic valve. They don't usually image quite this well. And on the right is a tissue AVR. Okay, this is a clip from the new Acuson 3D probe that was delivered to us on Thursday and it's not gated and the colour Doppler is quite amazing promise to be quite useful in defining the regurgitation and the mechanisms causing it as well as enabling accurate measurements. Unfortunately the only patient we got to use it on was someone having a mitral valve repair and they had no aortic pathology so it really just shows up a normal aortic valve but I think we'll um, be using it a lot more. Okay, this, you've seen this slide a few times, this is my attempt at it. Um, some surgeons ask us to help size the valve. Intraoperative tone measurements usually underestimate the annulus size. If you can see both leaflets on either side of the true annulus, uh, which is what looks like the true diameter, you're not really measuring the diameter. But you're likely to be measuring the distance between the two white dots in the diagram on the right. That is between the, um, between the annulus and the commissure. Uh, for precision, and as the left ventricular annulus may not be a true circle, aortic circumference is usually measured using uh, CT when you're sizing for TAVI, but possibly the new echo machine may be useful for that. Fortunately, surgeons don't have to rely on our sizing. They have these sizes provided by the valve companies. Different companies have sizes which don't exactly match, a bit like clothes sizes in department stores. 
Maybe they want the surgeon to think he has put in a bigger valve than he expected to because he used one of theirs. Um, intraoperative echo is also used for looking for other pathology. This was something we didn't expect. We tried to float the swan and it didn't wedge till 65 centimetres. Um, the intraoperative uh, echo showed a large coronary sinus and the chest x-ray done in ICU afterwards showed the swan gans catheter passing into the right internal jugular vein across to the left side of SVC and then crossing back to the right atrium via the coronary sinus. Left side of um, SVC is not only have implications for insertion of pulmonary artery catheters but uh, are important because cardiac protection using retrograde cardioplegia is not possible. Also, recently dilated tricuspid annuluses are often being uh, repaired preemptively. Nowadays, if the annulus is more than 40 millimetres, you'd often get a tricuspid repair. Um, intraoperative echo is important for the placing of wires, cannulas and vents. Accurate intraaortic balloon pump positioning in the proximal descending aorta just below the head vessels is easy with transesophageal echo. The clip on the left shows a left ventricular vent in the left upper pulmonary vein. It's been passed into the left atrium via the right upper pulmonary vein and it should have gone through the mitral valve into the left ventricle where it would have kept the left ventricle from distending but instead it went into the left upper pulmonary vein. And the clip on the right is confirmation that the femoral wires in the descending aorta and so the artery real cannula is about to pass into the aorta where it should and not the IVC where it shouldn't. This LV vent had migrated through a tissue AVR causing severe regurgitation when the LV cross clamp was removed, when the aortic cross clamp was removed. Once it was pulled back, the tricuspid valve, uh, the, um, the, the uh, aortic prosthesis became competent. Post-bypass assessment after AVR focuses on regurgitation and gradients. Higher than expected gradients can be caused by small valves, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and stuck leaflets in a mechanical valve. In regurgitation, it's important to determine whether or not the jet is through or around the implanted valve. Uh, this is an uh, example of paravalvular leak, post-aortic valve replacement. It could have been due to stitches cutting out or to annular calcification preventing a snug fit of the valve. Whether regurgitation requires stopping the heart again and reoperating or reopening depends on the degree of regurgitation. It's usually eccentric and hard to access, assess. The site of the regurgitation, the age of the patient, the time already spent on bypass and whether or not the surgeon feels any improvements possible or not. Complications of surgery can also be seen in intraoperative echo. The most common are intracavity intra air and poor left ventricular function, often due to poor protection, poor cardioplegia. Since the aorta is always open in AVR, some degree of intracavity air is unavoidable. But with the use of carbon dioxide, aspiration, venting and de-airing manoeuvres, the effects can be mitigated. Intracavity air tends to collect under the roof of the left atrium and at the apex of the left ventricle. Aortic dissection and prosthesis problems are other complications we have to exclude. So air in the aortic root will tend to go down the right coronary artery as it is the uppermost. The clip on the right shows the surgeon agitating the, uh, the um, aorta, trying to dislodge air in the sinuses. Coronary artery air can manifest as ST changes, arrhythmias and sudden, often right-sided ventricular failure resting the heart on bypass and running high pressures to try and flush the air down the coronaries is the mainstay of treatment. Left sided air can be alarming but it's uh, usually clear quickly. Um, intramural hematoma and dissection can be seen, uh, can be due to the anti-grade needle, the cross clamp or arise from where the top ends of the coronary grafts are. There's a, there's a uh, intramural hematoma probably see there. And that's the, uh, a small aortic dissection caused by the aortic uh, vent in the ascending aorta. So this is an example of an MVR but I wanted to show it anyway because I suppose this could happen with an AVR. After a mitral replacement we tried to come off bypass but with the leaflets seemingly moving okay there was no output. The surgeon and the anaesthetist both realised about the same time that the valve was opening in systole the valve had been sewn in upside down.
Intraoperative echo is used extensively to guide hemodynamic management of the cardiac patient. Size of the LV cavity, contractility and uh, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation give fluid administration and inotrope usage, uh, guide fluid administration and inotrope usage. This ventricle either needs more time, inotropes, but not more fluids. Aortic valve repair. Um, the benefits of aortic valve repair that seem to be driving its development are the avoidance of warfarin and the expectation of improved long-term results compared with maybe ROS procedures, homographs and tissue prostheses. I'm going to talk about the different procedures, the different sorts of valves, what makes the repair more or less likely to succeed and how we measure the success of the procedure. The indications for aortic valve repair are Aortic regurgitation due to aortic dilatation. Aortic regurgitation due to bicuspid valves. Aortic dissection repair where the valve can be spared. And simple perforations caused by endocarditis. So this is my diagram trying to explain the mechanisms of aortic regurgitation. It can be due to either dilatation of the ascending aorta or the root or both. Bicuspid valves are associated with aortopathy but can cause regurgitation themselves due to prolapse or restriction of cusp movement. And restriction of cusp movement can also be caused by uh, rheumatic disease. Prolapse and restriction of cusps is mostly due to different lengths of the free edges and correcting these disparate lengths of the free edges of the two cusps is a major part of bicuspid aortic valve surgery, surgical repair. This is a typical eccentric regurgitation of a bicuspid aortic valve in a dilated ascending aorta and root. So how I understand bicuspid valves to be uh, classified. There are many ways of classifying them. You can use the number of cusps, either functionally or morphologically, the number of raphes, and the number of commissures. Siever's classification uses the number of raphes. Spatial positioning of the cusps and raphes further helps describe the valve and the function of the, the functional valve, the functional state of the valve should always should also be mentioned. The valve on the left has a rafe between where the right and the left cusps would normally be and it's a sievers type one. The valve on the right has a tiny or no rafe and is a sievers type zero. Both cusps are of similar size and that valve would probably be, be a bit easier to repair. The valve on the left is a bicuspid valve, Sievers type 0. The valve on the right is a unicuspid valve, Sievers type 2. But because it has two raphes, it can look tricuspid. Very similar to George's slides. There are two different sorts of aortic valve repairs. Remodelling leaves the valve connected to the ventricle. Without an annular plasty, it is prone to dilate at the base. This type of operation includes the ACU procedure. <coughs> Reimplantation <coughs> removes the valve and reimplants it into a new conduit. Reimplantation is the David procedure, and there are several sorts of them. Other procedures include those undertaken specifically on the leaflets themselves. Risk factors for an unsuccessful bicuspid valve repair include a dilated root, prolapse, calcification of the cusps, stenosis and an increasing degree of asymmetry between the valve leaflets. Anatomical features of a repaired valve have been shown to determine the, sex, the success of repair and its durability. Effective height is the distance between a line joining the bases of the cusps and the most distal point of coaptation. Coaptation length is the distance the leaflets touch during valve closure. Geometric height is the length between the base of the cusp and its tip and is measured by the surgeon with a specific device. Post repair measurements that you should be aiming for are an annulus of greater than 25, geometric height of uh, 
annulus of less than 25 hours. Geometric height of greater than 20 millimetres. Effective height greater than 9 millimetres. A coaptation length of greater than 5 millimetres or greater than or equal to. An effective regurgitant orifice of less than 0.1 centimetre squared. And a mean aortic gradient of less than about 10. This was a recent aortic valve repair that we did. It was a Sievers type 1 bicuspid aortic valve with severe eccentric regurgitation. This was the 3D view of that valve. You can see the raphe between the left and the right cusps. After the first attempt to repair this valve, it had no regurgitation but there was a gradient across the valve of at least 15 millimetres, mean gradient. One of the, the patient went back on to bypass, the valve was opened up again, and one of the plications on the valve edges was undone to loosen the repair, and the gradient <coughs> reduced to 10 millimetres of mercury. The measurements all indicated a good repair with likely good durability. The annulus was 21 millimetres, the effective height was 9.4 millimetres, and the co height was 6 millimetres. There was little, no regurgitation on, um, on colour Doppler, so after the second attempt the valve repair was accepted. So I've tried to prevent a quick run through of the anaesthetist's perspective on aortic valve surgery. No longer is aortic valve surgery just valve replacement. It involves an understanding of the pathology, the surgery, and how they all affect the preservation of, of the cardioplegic heart. Thanks very much. <laughs>